Certainly a privilege to be before you this morning. Thankful for the opportunity to speak. If you would be turning to the book of Genesis, chapter 50. And we'll be reading verses 22 through 26. In this account, it's the last few verses of the book of Genesis. We see primarily one event that I think that oftentimes might get overlooked as we read through it. But I'd like to take a few moments this morning to study it with you. Genesis chapter 50, verses 22 through 26. It says, And Joseph dwelt in Egypt, he and his father's house. And Joseph lived a hundred and ten years. And Joseph saw Ephraim's children of the third generation, the children also of Machir, the son of Manasseh, were brought upon Joseph's knees. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I die, and God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land unto the land which he sware to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and ye shall carry up my bones from hence. So Joseph died, being an hundred and ten years old, and they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. So it's quite an interesting account here. We see that he charged his children to take up his bones, his remains, and this, this obviously passed through the generations, for we see Moses following through with this later, and we'll talk about more about that later as the lesson progresses. But you couple this with Hebrews chapter 11, verse 22, where it says, By faith Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel, and gave commandment concerning his bones. So with both of these together, we see that Joseph was a man of great faith. So with Romans chapter 15, verse 4, in mind, let us consider three lessons from the bones of Joseph. First, we would like to consider that true faith looks beyond death. We see that Joseph led a long and eventually rich life. He lived 110 years. We see that in Genesis chapter 37, verse 3, he was Jacob's favorite son. Ultimately, he would be betrayed by his brethren, Genesis 37, verse 28, where he was sold into slavery. In Genesis 39, verse 12, we see the account with Joseph and Potiphar's wife, how he tried to seduce him, or she tried to seduce him, and he ran away. This ultimately led to his imprisonment. Genesis chapter 39, verse 20. In prison, he would, I guess you could say, make friends with fellow prisoners and ultimately be released and go on to interpret Pharaoh's dream. Genesis chapter 41, verses 1 through 36. And in the latter part of that chapter, we see that he later becomes second only to Pharaoh. As we consider each of these events... Each one demonstrates Joseph's outstanding character and his great faith. We note in Genesis chapter 39 verse 21 says, But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy. So God was with him primarily throughout his imprisonment, but of course throughout his life. We see the great faith of Joseph in his last words. Often the last words of an individual are considered of great importance. They typically reveal the most forethought or foremost thoughts of that person. And typically they'll view it, I'm sure, as not having any resistance. After all, what are they going to do? Kill me? So you're going to get their thoughts on any given situation. So obviously, Joseph's thoughts were on his remains leaving Egypt. Joseph's last words pointed to confidence in God. He believed in Israel's then future exodus. He stated, God will surely visit you. Not just, I think he's coming to visit you, but he will surely do so. 
We saw that in Genesis 50, verses 24 and 25. He even repeats himself. Thus Joseph wanted to go home, as it were, to the promised land. You see, Joseph, being 110 years, probably spanned at least three generations of the Egyptians. The average lifespan during those days was around 35 years old. So no doubt he was serving under at least two to three, maybe even four different pharaohs. And I was doing a little bit of research on that culture, and anyone with, with that age would automatically be considered wise. And even father to the pharaoh is a title that many of these people received if they were that old. So that's quite an interesting study in and of itself. But nonetheless, Joseph would have had that title, no doubt. But he being there for so long, he would have been immersed in that culture. We think about all the pyramids over there, and we think about what they're for. Those are ultimately coffins for pharaohs. The idea behind a pyramid was whenever that pharaoh died, he would climb up the steps to the top and then ride a beam of light up to what they considered heaven. That was their afterlife. Because in the Egyptian mythology, the pharaoh himself was also considered a god. None of this was appealing to Joseph. Joseph wanted to be embalmed. Well, he was embalmed. He was put in a coffin. And his dying wish was to be taken with the children of Israel to the promised land. Porter Wagner made, wrote the song. I guess he wrote it. He performed a song, Green, Green Grass of Home. And you can follow that, those lyrics. It's basically the idea that we see here. He wants to ultimately be buried beneath the green, green grass of home. I read recently about, the. I guess it's a couple in Italy. Well, their, their child was going to be born soon, so they flew in some Texas dirt so the child could be born in Texas dirt. And I, that's not the first time I've heard of that, but that's kind of the idea that Joseph has. Don't, don't bury me here. Take me, take me with you to the promised land. You see, Joseph was not able to see the promised land in life, but he would be there in death at least his physical remains. Now he did see the promised land through his faith. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. And as we mentioned earlier, Moses showed his great fidelity to Joseph's charge in Exodus chapter 13, verse 19. It's where it's stated that he took Joseph's bones as they exited Egypt. Now, no, no doubt to the children of Israel that this sarcophagus, this coffin that Joseph was held in, stood to represent Joseph's great faith to those Israelites. It also represented to them, or at least it should have served, as an example of God's providence and care. With both of those, it would have provided a boost to morale. We have this great patriarch promising or restating the promise that we would be freed from Egyptian captivity and lo and behold he was right it wasn't a shot in the dark though it was a, a promise that God had made we later see that the remains of Joseph were laid to rest in Shechem Joshua chapter 24 verse 32 so we take note that Josh, or Joseph was a sojourner we as Christians are also sojourners at least we ought to be. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18, and also 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 11 through 14, which states, Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming day of the Lord, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the element shall melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace, without spot, and blameless. It's been stated before that some of the brethren have fallen in love with the, the campgrounds. And that's certainly true, and true of every generation. But that should not be the case. Secondly, true faith leans upon the promises of God. 
You see throughout the life of Joseph that he took God at his word. It's the simplest definition of faith. We see through scripture that God promised the land of Canaan to Abraham. Genesis 15 verses 18 through 21. He promised it again to Isaac. Genesis 26 verses 2 through 5. And then he would promise it again to Jacob. Genesis 28 verses 13 through 15. No doubt it is part of their teaching that helped solidify Joseph's faith. He was able to develop his own trust in God and his promises. You see, these three, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, lived together for a brief period of time. Hebrews 11 verse 9. Certainly Joseph would have benefited from three generations of teaching. And no doubt this, these promises came up in that teaching. We also note that Jesus, Joseph had personal experience. Genesis 50, 18 through 20. It says, And his brethren also went and fell down before his face. And they said, Behold, be, we be thy servants. This is after they found out that their brother was actually second in command. Been quite some time since they sold little brother into slavery. But they're finally realizing who this is. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for I am, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, ye thought evil against me. But God meant it unto good, to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. You see, Joseph might not have realized God's plan while he was carrying it out. Much like we are today, we don't realize providence until we look back. You know, God really took care of me in that situation. Well, of course, God takes care of his faithful children. Joseph realized this later in life, and possibly quite earlier as well, but we have it written for us in these verses. One that is to take God at his word must take note of what he has promised. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 13. We also must take note of the things that he has not promised. And if we're going to take God at his word, we must also recognize that it is impossible for God to lie. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18. After all, lying would be incompatible with God's holy and righteous nature. If he would lie, he would cease to be God. If we are to take God at his word, we must use proper reasoning. And that proper reasoning ultimately leads to proper faith. Romans 10, verse 17. In that word, we can see the evidence, we can see the accounts, and we realize we can know that God will perform His promises. Romans 4, verse 21. As such, one will act on these promises. If you will recall, a purpose of the Bible is to provide sufficient evidence for us today. Not just a little bit of evidence, but sufficient evidence for us to seek out God, to be obedient to Him. This evidence will provide and does provide for a strong foundation. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1. It's a substance. It's that undergirding truth that supports, if you will, the bridge. It's what we can place our faith on and it will not waver. This foundation will lead to obedience. Typically, it's starting out to be the plan of salvation. Okay, there's no other way through heaven unless you take the first steps. As you saw that I reached this stage earlier, I had to take those steps. If I didn't, I'm not getting up here. You see, those steps come in hearing God's word, as we just stated, Romans 10, 17. Growing your belief in Christ, John 8, 24. Repenting of past sins, Acts, Acts 3, 19. Confessing Christ before others, Romans 10, verses 9 through 10. And ultimately being baptized, Acts chapter 22, verse 16. But it doesn't end there. Once that individual comes up out of the water of baptism, they must remain faithful unto death, Revelation 2, 10. Now certainly that applies to us. A little bit different for Joseph in his day. But of course we wouldn't apply this to us. Now, God has promised heaven to his faithful servants. 
we must keep that in mind. 1 Peter chapter three or chapter one verses three through nine. If we're found faithful, we'll be given heaven, and that's an eternal life for the faithful. Third, we consider that true faith learns to emphasize the good. You see, God's promises, at least in the one that we're talking about this morning, this promised deliverance also came with affliction. It came with enslavement. You see, the children of Israel ultimately would be enslaved by Egypt. For there rose a Pharaoh that knew not Joseph. These Israelites would serve Egypt for over 40 years, Genesis chapter 15, verse 13 and 14. We see that many of these Israelites would be brutally beaten and ultimately suffer death. And we look at all the millions of babies that were thrown into the Nile River because of population control, at least the attempt to do so. So many Israelites would die because of the evil of Egypt. In Joseph's final words, no doubt he realized this. But what was his focus? His focus was towards the end of that prophecy. The actual deliverance. We will be leaving. You will be escaping Egypt. Take me with you. But we must be kept in mind that Israel needed to endure all of the things that they, were, they would face in order to receive that deliverance. If they gave up, they wouldn't receive it. But you see throughout their history in the wilderness wandering and even shortly before it, they were always pleading, take us back to Egypt, at least we had food, at least we had shelter. They had lost sight of the promised land. So we see that Joseph was keeping in mind the, the promise of deliverance which led to his request to have his bones carried away. There have been many throughout Scripture that have endured hardship. Abel, the very beginning, Abel dealt with hardship. His brother killed him, Genesis 4, 1 through 8. He had, he had the righteous sacrifice. His brother did not. Cain decided that the best way to solve that problem was through violence. So he rose up and killed his brother. Daniel suffered hardship. Daniel 6. We see the account of him in the lion's den. Or the lions in the Daniel den, if you will. God protected him through that account. We see Stephen in Acts chapter 7. He was preaching God's word and ultimately was stoned for it because he said something that these people didn't like. Now each of these received their due reward for their faithfulness to God. Now, as we look around, it is quite easy for us to focus on the negativity. Just like positivity, negativity is also contagious. If you ever have somebody that's kind of down and gloomy, it kind of spreads to other folks. It's easy to do that. This COVID-19 business is always on our mind. It's probably the worst thing that this generation's seen, besides hard work. And it's probably been probably the worst thing that many people have seen in quite some time. So we're always thinking about it. And it's easy to get down with this as far as, oh great, what's going on with COVID today? Who's going to be getting it? Who's going to be testing positive? Who's going to be dying from it? Regardless of how you feel about the news and what they say and the disease itself, it is here. And it's easy to be negative about it. But as Joseph did, he saw past death. You know, COVID-19 is not all there is to life. The Rona may kill you, but if you are faithful to God, that doesn't matter. And that's one point I'd like to point out or make from the bones of Joseph. You know, this physical realm is not all there is to life. And I'm so thankful for that. The atheist would have you believe that. We spent four sermons talking about creation and apologetics. Hopefully it was a decent education. But if this physical world is all there is, we have no hope. 
you're like, as it's been stated, if you're you're like Rover, you're dead all over. Okay, there's no spiritual realm. But we know better than that. We have to think better than that, though. We have to live it out. Once we die, our spirit goes to one of two places. And how we live in this flesh is going to determine that. We see from Matthew chapter 8, verse 24 through 27, that, is, that the disciples of Jesus were afraid. It says, And when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves. But he, that is Jesus, was asleep. And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he saith unto them, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. But the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? You see, Jesus had that peace that passeth all understanding. He was able to sleep throughout this storm in the boat out here on the water. Do you have that type of peace? Can you lay your head down every night knowing that you served God to the best of your ability that day? And then if God grants you the next day that you're going to get up and do the same thing all over again? To be even more faithful to Him that day? No doubt that was the attitude that Jesus had. But you see, His disciples were afraid. But they found out that they weren't just in the presence of a mere mortal. They were in the presence of the Alpha and the Omega. He had power over these elements, for he called them into existence. We ought today have the attitude of Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. In Daniel chapter 3, verses 16 through 18, where they were speaking with King Nebuchadnezzar about their actions and not bowing down to the statue. Verse 16 reads, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. You realize the type of courage that it took to say that to this king? I dare say that many of us today, especially in America, have no idea what kind of courage that took. Because especially with us, we supposedly have religious freedoms. But you see after these verses that Nebuchadnezzar actually cast them into that fiery furnace. They're saying this knowing that's probably going to happen. Are we that fierce in the heat of battle? For we do fight a battle. It's a spiritual battle every day. Such a great attitude to have. We're going to be faithful to God regardless of what you do to us. And they were. And they were later delivered for it. And you see in the, later in that passage, that, that chapter, that God took care of them. Not only did he free them from that furnace, but they were blessed with many material goods. Now that's not to say that we're going to receive the same type of blessing in this life. Don't serve God for the goods, the physical wealth. Our treasure should be in heaven. That's why we should be faithful to God. As Christians, we are to be the salt of the earth. Matthew 5, verse 13. We're also to be the light of the world. Matthew 5, 14 through 16. You see, throughout all negativity, it's easy to be negative yourself. But as a light, even how small a light it might be, you're providing warmth, you're providing vision to wherever you're at. If you turn off all the lights in this auditorium, and you get a candle, you're going to provide light for a small space. That's basically the Christian in this physical realm. For this world is darkness. People that are in it, they have no care for the spiritual matters that God cares about. 
It's our job, though, to spread that light, to teach others out of their sin, to convert them. You have one Christian in a dark room, provides a little bit of light. You get a couple of them together, the light increases. And ultimately, you have a room that's very well lit, such as this. Ideally, that's what we turn the world into. You can't do that through negativity alone. Now, certainly, that was a negative statement. Sometimes we need negative negativity. But to have the outlook on life that you're always in a bad mood, you're always complaining about something, that is wrong. Rather, we are to be the leavening agent for good. Luke chapter 13, verse 21. As the writer of Hebrews states in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 2, he's summing up Hebrews 11. He states, this great cloud of witnesses. We're supposed to set aside all the distractions that we might face. Some of them might not be sin in and of themselves, but they would still distract us from gaining the prize at the end of this life. And also Philippians 4, verse 4, we are to rejoice. As Christians, that should be our first and foremost thought, rejoice. My boss typically will say, you know, somebody will ask him how he's doing today. Oh, doing fine. Better six feet up and six feet down. You know, there's always a silver lining. Always a silver lining. Back to this COVID business, you know. Again, it's easy to get down about it, be negative. But think about all the different opportunities we've been given because of it. Every, everyone in this auditorium should, if they're faithful to God, have a greater appreciation for the assembly of God's people. Should have a greater appreciation for the fellowship that exists only between God and His faithful children. If you don't, there is a problem. And you need to examine yourselves. Galatians 6.10 how many opportunities are there that we have been given because of this virus to do good unto those that are outside of the church? Even those that are in the church. Those that might not be considered, quote, essential workers. Whatever that really means. You know, there's a lot of folks that have lost their jobs. Are we helping them out? Folks that might be directly affected, maybe the loss of a loved one from this virus. Are we comforting them? Are we doing everything in our power to provide for their physical needs? And then using that as an avenue to talk about the spiritual needs. Every natural disaster that comes along, that's exactly the same result. Ultimately, it is a way for us as Christians to do the work of the church. Are we taking that opportunity? Part of that rejoicing is realizing that every day is a gift. My grandmother has a, a magnet on her, her refrigerator regarding that. Every day is a gift. That's why they call it a present. Okay, do we really view that life, this day, as a gift from God? Psalm 118, verse 24. It truly is a blessing from God. Now, along with the promises, and in spite of the negativity, we must also realize that we will suffer persecution for righteousness' sake. Throughout history, the, the godly have always been hated. They've always been in the minority. But it's going to happen. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 through, or first, or chapter 3, verse 12. We will suffer persecution. We will be hated for the righteousness that we live out. Typically, it'll at least with us, come in the form of being made fun of. People cracking jokes about us. If that's the best you've got, you know, try harder next time. But if that's the worst thing that you could say about a Christian, they must be doing something right. You're making fun of them for not going out to the bar later, not going out to, you know, all kind of clubs for debauchery. Thank you. God, consider that a compliment. Throughout the persecution, we should not be ashamed. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 16. And then Romans chapter 8, verses 36 and 37. Paul says, As it is written, For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. I've been told they can kill you, but they can't eat you. Well, I don't care if they eat me or not. I'm dead. Well, that's the point of that. 
They might kill us, but Jesus tells us what? Don't fear those that can kill the body only. Fear the one that can destroy the soul in hell. You see, there are more things beyond death, and that should give us a positive attitude. So as we draw this lesson to a close, I'd like to try to summarize some of the things we've discussed. We saw that Joseph was a great man of faith, a man of great faith, both of those. We see that his request to have his bones removed from Egypt and taken to the promised land shows that he was concerned more about spiritual matters, not just the physical world. He was concerned more than just his death. He was thoughtful, concerned about receiving the promised land. He knew it was coming, but he also knew that he would never see it through his physical eyes. But through the eye of faith, he was able to. And that's what kept him going. He knew that God would follow through with his promise of deliverance. And this example serves us, it should, that God will fulfill his promises that he's made to us. I've been told that my great-grandfather's favorite song was Standing on the Promises of God. So every time we sing that song, I think of him. I didn't know him all that well. But from what I've been told, he was quite a faithful man. So this is, yeah, those are happy thoughts. And those should be said about our family members. Assuming, of course, that they were faithful to God. But we should be able to stand on the promises of God. Leaning on His word. Leaning on His promises. We also see that Joseph had a long life that was filled with hardship. However, in the end, God took care of him. Joseph might not have realized it while he was enduring those hardships, but God nonetheless was taking care of him. And God ultimately used him to develop the Messianic nation of Israel. You might say that Joseph's hard work paid off. So we must follow his example of perseverance and obedience. We are under the Christian dispensation at this time, specifically the New Testament of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. So we need to learn that testament. We need to be familiar with it. And it should give us encouragement, should help us persevere through the different things that we're facing in this life. Now we've already talked about what must be done in order to be saved. If you are an alien sinner, follow that plan of salvation. If you need to study more, that's perfectly fine. But don't wait till it's too late. Because there will come a day where you will not have the ability to say, Hey, I am lost. I want to be baptized. Now, if you are an erring child of God, repentance and prayer will restore you to a correct relationship with you and your Father. Through uh, uh, James chapter 5, verse 16, and 1 John 1, verses 7 through 9. If you have any need, whether it be to be restored or to put on Christ in baptism, whatever that need may be, please make it known as together we stand and sing.